I am Guillermo Marin. I work at the BSC at the Visualization Group. And I'm, uh, you might remember me for a movie you saw, I think, uh, yesterday or the day before uh, called Virtual Humans. So I directed it and worked with uh, Paul here that made some of the simulations of the, blood, uh, the red blood cells. And I'm going to use this hour to give you um, some uh, views of what it, how data visualization is important for researchers in terms of communicating your results and uh, exploring your uh, data. And uh, yeah, hopefully you will find it interesting and uh, uh, want to learn more after this. So yeah, this is the movie. These are some of the things that I do. Uh, we usually work with uh, uh, simulation data, the results of simulations which uh, are made in Mare Nostrum mostly, and most of them are inherently 3D data. The uh, um, aerodynamics of cars and planes and, and things that happen in a 3D space. But the principles that we apply to do this are the same um, as of uh, 2D charts. So what I'm going to show you is mostly 2D charts, simple uh, charts and graphs, uh, so the principles can be seen more clearly, okay? So visualization is an area of research, and as that, there is not a clear definition. There are lots of competing ones. Uh, so for now, let's start with saying that is the visual representation of complex information, yes? And, uh, but more than what it is, is uh, it's more important to, to say uh, why do we visualize. And we do it because we are not very good at extracting information of uh, abstract representations like characters, letters, numbers, and things like that. And visualizations are uh, like cognitive tools that help us uh, think, that help us analyze uh, big chunks of data uh, in an easier way than in tables and things like that. So, and we do that with uh, two main uh, goals. One is the exploration of the data. So explore it and um, uh, so in a way that it helps us to make more questions, to raise, raise questions about our data, to interrogate the data. And the other one is uh, the communication of results, to convey them and to explain things and hopefully, well, to affect uh, decision making, for example. For exploration, we usually use uh, the more simple and common uh, types of uh, visual representations like bar charts, pie charts, scatter plots. I'm sure you have used most of them. And for communication, we usually use uh, posters uh, or papers or slides that might have some of this uh, embedded, yes? So this is an example. This is a clear and elegant display of uh, the uh, vaccine, uh, sorry, the um, uh, measles, yeah, the disease, measles, uh, cases in the US by state and uh, the um, um, incidence in thousands of people, thousands of, uh, of uh, disease people. And the interesting thing of this chart is that uh, it has uh, an eighth, a visual eighth here, this line that marks the, uh, when the vaccine was introduced. So even without it, you can clearly see that the, the impact, which is the purpose of this visualization, is to show the impact of a vaccine introduction over the the, the disease in the, in the US. Um, uh, here, the, the color is the number of cases. The, the line of reference marks the, the, the year where the vaccine was introduced. And yeah, the, vert the horizontal lines are the, um, the states in the US. But the data can say more than that. This is another graph made with the same data set. And this one is uh, the year. This doesn't have the states. This one has the years and the weeks of the year. So you can see that even before the vaccination was, the vaccine was introduced, there was a strong seasonality on the measles uh, disease. So this is, this is kind of an exploratory graph that uh, can uh, lead you to ask different questions about your data. And the other ones are similar uh, charts to the one we saw before, but with different um, diseases, hepatitis, hepatitis A, uh, rubiola and polio, and the measles. And together they send a 
different message, which is uh, la, it can be used as evidence against the anti-vaccination uh, people. Yes. So showing more uh, helps to send the message more clearly than only one. So uh, yes. So visualization is like our uh, umbrella terms for the visual displays of information. But uh, and we have three main types, let's say. You, you will, at least you will hear these three terms uh, more often, uh, which is data visualization, information visualization, and scientific visualization. Data visualization is usually a display of data designed to enable the analysis, yes? Uh, exploration and the discovery in the data. And uh, it mainly doesn't have uh, predefined messages. It's just uh, there are tools to let people uh, draw their own conclusions. So yeah, this one is, uh, shows uh, the correlation between the number of people who uh, drowned, uh, who died in, in a pool, uh, against the films that Nicolas Cage appeared in by year. And you see that there is a clear correlation between the two. Uh, the information visualization uh, um, can refer to other types of visual representations, not just quantitative, like a metro map or this uh, map of the, this layout of the top, top copy uh, temple in Istanbul. So they are also visual representations of information, but uh, not quantitative in this case. And the third type is the scientific visualizations, which are basically a visualizations of scientific data, which you can have from, from a variety of uh, domains, like uh, medical, material science, physics, engineering, geographical information systems, and so on. But uh, yeah, the world is more complex than that. These are the, the terms that you will most uh, uh, hear the most, in, at least in, 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 in a research environment. But uh, you are more exposed to this kind of uh, visualizations. These are infographics, which are basically uh, sum ups of uh, various visualizations to explain one thing. This is a uh, composition of the um, ice in, uh, in skate uh, fields. And the other one explains the, um, the job of a referee, soccer referee. So they are combinations of text, uh, charts, graphs, and any other visual means of um, conveying information. You also have that data art. This one is called Weather Baskets. It's from an artist that uh, recorded uh, the weather in near the beach in California, I think, uh, for uh, a year, I believe, or something like that, so 18 months, and use the data to build these things. Uh, she has lots of them. And basically, the knots and the, and the shapes in the basket indicate something that, uh, of the weather. The, if it was cloudy, if it was cold, temperature, uh, state of the sea, things like that, that she uh, wrote down in a notebook and then translated into this uh, kind of uh, this thing, this basket. And the other one is a map of the um, uh, United States flights on one day, made by Aaron Koblin. And <clears throat> these are uh, closer to art because uh, the information that they convey is not uh, really as accurate or, or, or easy to read as to um, be applied for, for the purposes that the other ones are, yes, to, to, uh, to analyze it. And there's also two other kinds that I want to show you that are data physicalization and data food, which is to take the data representations out of a, a, plain, a, a display and to the street in this case or to a plate in the other one. Uh, this one is an installation on a public park where people could go and grab a string from corresponding to their ethnicity and start to tie it in this uh, parallel coordinates graph according to their demographics, age, uh, the place they live, how long does it take to go to work, and so on. And it uh, well, gave a good impression of uh, the kind of people that lived in a place. And the other one is uh, the percentage of women in academia in three countries, uh, Turkey, Japan, and Belgium, I, I believe. And uh, it seems like very artistic, but it uh, raises relevant questions in visualizations, uh, referring to um, uh, do we remember better when we can touch things, when we can uh, experience things that, uh, than when we only see them in a, in a computer? 
does, uh, do we remember better if we can taste or, or associate some taste or smell to the experience of seeing the data? So these are uh, yeah, questions that uh, are um, currently being researched in visualization as well. So it is art, it is closer to art, but it is uh, also uh, related to visualization. So we are only going to see data visualization and information visualization, the first two parts. And this is a diagram that shows uh, the process of creating data visualization. The important thing here is, uh, or at least in my view, is that the human needs to be at the center of the loop. We are designing for someone to execute a task, a certain task. And we have to keep that in mind because it will tell us what kind of visualization we have to make, what kind of uh, design decisions we have to take, and so on. So why should you care? Well, uh, it, I think it's important for researchers to know a bit of visualization, and it's often neglected. It's something that uh, you don't see much in, in classes or in other places. But uh, misusing visualizations can have uh, consequences, like obscuring the data, not uh, helping you to, to analyze it properly, or more often not uh, uh, making optimal communication. Yes, do you see the problems here, right? You have 50% occupying, I don't know, uh, 30, 40 something percent in the pie chart. And there you have, this is the precipitations, yes, by month, and this is the temperature, and they are both in the same scale. So you, you, I hope you, they never have in cairns a temperature raising 400 degrees or something like that. And you can, in the worst case scenario, you can distort the data completely and send a completely, uh, yeah, a wrong message. This, uh, you can say it's intentionate, maybe not, who knows? Yes, it's, uh, they are showing the unemployment in, in Spain, the, the progress of it. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, and you also see, what problems do you see here? Yes, yes so it's, they, they just draw the line like this, but there's another problem as well, which is you don't have the y, y scale, very good. So one part of uh, this is choosing the right plot. Uh, Choosing the right plot means choosing the data where the, the plot where the data is more clearly represented in uh, respect to the task that you want your audience to, to perform. So sometimes there is no choice, like this one, for instance, an MRI, that you have uh, little options to, to make your visualization. But uh, some others, uh, you have a lot of options you have to choose from. Um, one advice here is uh, go with the, um, with your, try to go at first at least with your, the conventions in your field. Yes, for instance, in life science, you, I think you work a lot with uh, matrices and um, circular diagrams, like the ones that Circus makes. Um, yeah, and some other times it's more difficult to choose the the right uh, plot, especially with a more general plot, like scatter bars, uh, pie charts, uh, histograms, line charts, and so on, because uh, they are, well, quite similar, or at least used in similar cases. So one place you can start from is, if you're unsure, is uh, this chart, which is a chart suggestion uh, diagram that uh, points you towards uh, certain types of visualizations of charts uh, according to the task that you want to do. If you want to, uh, your uh, audience to make comparison, then you should go for the ones on the top. If you want them to make relate, to establish relationships between categories, then you can do something like this, scatter some or bubble charts and so on. I will hand this off to you so you can uh, uh, check it with uh, more time. But uh, tools like this are good places to, to start with, to, to, to choose uh, the optimal plot. So you can also decide what chart to use in terms of the visual encoding. Um, visual encoding means matching the data 
to uh, visual elements like uh, dots, <coughs> position, length, and so on. This is a ranking from a book from Alberto Cairo that tells us which uh, visual encodings are more efficient according to experimental testing. So, uh, and, and this comes because uh, we are better at, our brains are somewhat tuned, apparently, to perform certain tasks over others. So, uh, in this uh, regard, so uh, this, the, <coughs> the visual representations at the top are things that we can make uh, like uh, faster than the ones at the bottom, are tasks that we can perform faster than the ones at the bottom. So we, and we are better to establish uh, precise uh, um, uh, more accurate uh, comparisons uh, in uh, positions on common scale, uh, slight um, differences in, in length or, position or vertical position, and less accurate uh, comparisons with these ones. Yeah? Curvature, volume, 3D is usually not very good to convey accurate information about accurate uh, comparisons of, uh, between data, data points, and so on. So, uh, some tips to make good graphs, which are also common mistakes in uh, information visualization, which are pay attention to the axis, the, like in the example I showed you before, the y-axis, but it also happens with the x-axis, <coughs> as we will see. Uh, another good practice is add annotations, then show your data and avoid chart junk. Let's uh, see them individually. So, uh, yes. Uh, pay attention to the axis. You see the, this one is the one that is wrong, obviously, and this is a corrected version. So the problem with uh, showing this is that the differences might uh, appear. You, might, you are showing them as to be bigger than they are, uh, how they really are. So cutting the axis can have that effect. It can happen with the x-axis as well. Uh, I don't think you will see the problem here because it's here, but uh, you have uh, intervals of five years in the x-axis, and when you arrive to 2005, they jump to, uh, they change to intervals of one year. So what you had in this space uh, from here uh, to, to this, in this direction, you have it uh, like expanded in, in, so the appearance is of a flatter line that, what probably is this. So this is another example of uh, distorting the, the data for not choosing wisely the x-axis. This is another uh, known example. Of, I don't know if you've seen it. This is uh, from a, lo um, <coughs> a lobby that denies the climate change. And they released this chart in Twitter saying the only climate change chart you need to see, which shows average temperature of the uh, uh, global temperature in the last 100 and something years, 110, I believe. And they show a flat line. Yeah? So the average temperature hasn't moved. There is no global warming at all. But the axis goes from 0 to 110 degrees, which is a variation that won't happen never. So, the, of course, this is Twitter, and a lot of trolls jumped in to, <laughs> to respond to that, uh, like this one, saying that uh, we can do the same with federal debt in the U.S. Just uh, put the, the data in an axis that is ridiculously big, yes? So this would be the correct graph of the global, the, the average temperature over the 110 years. And this would be the correct graph instead of the other one, because uh, from the previous examples, it might be easy to think that uh, you should never cut the y-axis, right? But uh, and it, it is tricky, but if you want to show trend, like in this case, and you will never have the extreme values, then you might. So cutting the y-axis depends on the message that you want to, to to, to convey and also on the data that you have. 
This is another example. This is uh, one chart that we made at the BSC. Uh, this is uh, measurements and simulations of the power generated by in kilowatts generated by uh, windmills in a wind farm. Um, yes, so here we want to know the difference between the measurements and the simulations. And this is not time. This is individual windmills. And because we want to see the difference between uh, the two and which windmills uh, generate more or less power, we don't need the complete axis. This is cut to 260 kilowatts to 440, which is the maximum value. So we don't need everything. And because we don't have a huge axis with a small data uh, gathered at, at, at the top, we can better see the differences between them, yes, because they are expanded in the y-axis. So annotations, this is uh, something that uh, is usually not done in, uh, in research uh, papers and scientific figures. And I think it's uh, the most important thing you, you can do is add annotations, put clear annotations on your graphs and don't assume that your audience is going to know how to interpret or read them. Uh, and this, this is an example of don't, yes? <laughs> I saw <laughs> the faces here. Uh, yes, this is what you, will most, uh, what you see often in, in, yeah, in conferences or papers or so on. Uh, and this assumes a lot of things. So for instance, ways to, to fix this would be to um, put these numbers in a more natural way, maybe express that in kilometers instead of meters so you don't have such big numbers given that you don't have a precision over here in the thousands. Uh, you can also choose uh, data points instead of the names here or smaller labels so it can be easier to read and yes yeah, so on. And this would be the example of good. You have a, a, a title, you have a, your axis named properly, what is in, in each, uh, well, actually you would have years here, but I cut it, okay? So it's my fault, not this. Uh, you also always, always put a color scale if you are using uh, colors to encode information. Um, uh, and one thing that is often not done but is very useful is to mark remarkable events. Yes, put uh, marks on things that your audience, uh, on things that you want your audience to see first. So highlighting them is uh, always a good idea. Yes, so um, show your data has to do with uh, we sometimes uh, show uh, aggregated data, yes, and this uh, is useful and good because it's uh, clear to see, but uh, you might be obscuring things. So showing the, the complete distribution or at least uh, plotting it to yourself is a good idea as well because you might uh, see uh, things that are hidden when you aggregate the data. This is uh, the ASCOM quartet, it's called the ASCOM quartet, and these four distributions as different as they are, have the exact same statistics, summary statistics. They have the same mean, the same um, um, variance and, um, and mode and average, yes? And, but they are very different. So showing all your data points might be, uh, or, or at least to yourself, might be a good idea. And you can also uh, not show all the data on purpose, like if in this case that shows that Trump is very popular. Everybody approves them, but yeah, it's kind of chapucero. If you see closely, you see that this is only among Republicans in small letters. But also if we see the complete data sets and visualize in a meaningful way, we see that uh, this approval is summing up two categories of strongly and somewhat approved, which are not the same. They are only showing the Republicans part. Yes, and they are summing up the others. So if you plot it like that, you have a completely different, you are sending a completely different message. 
So this is an example of deceptive visualizations, but the results might be, might, you can achieve them also by omission. So by not showing all your distribution or not taking into account all your data points. And the last tip is to avoid uh, what is called chart junk, which is uh, putting too much things on your graphs. So something like that is obviously nobody is going to be able to read it. So uh, <clears throat> in this case, for instance, uh, things to fix, uh, ways to fix these visualizations would be to uh, avoid the color in the background. Yes, so colors in the background distract. And color is also one channel. Colors is a visual channel that we use to encode information. Yes? Uh, and we do it. it it's uh, one of the most common ways of encoding information. And if you use one color in your background or in your axis or in other visual element in the chart, you are not being able to use it for your vis visualization. So it's better to save colors if you are using it for data, just for data. Uh, another thing is uh, clarify the, the points in the axis as well. And uh, sometimes, like in this case, you might have to rethink your visualization and not put it all together so it's easier to read. This is one solution to split the series, one on each graph to show the, the trend and it can be compared easier. If you see there are attenuated lines here, which are the other ones, yes? So it is a more clearer way to, to, to perform the task that was compare the series one to, to another. Uh, yes, and a word on pie charts. Pie charts are like the um, comic sans, but of charts. But uh, recently I've been look, uh, reading things uh, that uh, make it not so, I, made me change my mind. So I'm going to make a point about pie charts. So in most cases, the pie chart is the wrong choice. Yes? And because it doesn't work for all data types and, uh, so, and, and has some problems inherent to it. One problem is it doesn't work for many categories. You can't, uh, uh, as, a, as a user, you cannot um, make accurate comparisons in, in area or, um, or, or angle when you have many categories. Yes, you, you can't tell the difference between these two or even these two. It's impossible. So it doesn't work for many categories. And the other thing is that when you have a similar values, it is also equally uh, difficult to, <coughs> to appreciate the differences. If you see the bar charts over there, you have four uh, pie charts which are more or less the same, but the, the quantities vary a lot, yes? So bar charts are, in many cases, a better option to display data. However, sometimes the pie chart might be a valid choice. This is uh, the... Um, the, the presence of uh, the Russia gate thing on, on the press during a certain amount of time. And it's a comparison between the total al time allocated for that news against others yes, versus the non Russia issues versus non-Russia issues. And if you see here, it's, very di it's more difficult to establish the comparisons. While in the pie chart is more evident because this is a slight difference in angle, yes? Let's just see it more clearly. And this is because <coughs> uh, we are comparing parts to a whole, which is the uh, strength of pie charts. When you split, uh, when you are showing parts to something that sum up to a whole. So yes, some uh, rules to use uh, pie charts wisely is don't use it where the parts don't sum up to a whole. So if you are showing percentages, like in this case here, it will work. But when you are showing uh, quantities, like raw data, then it might not be the best um, option for you. Yes. Uh, 
also if you are comparing the parts to the whole and not the parts among themselves. If you are comparing the parts between themselves, then again, a bar chart might be a better option. Also, uh, it is good when you have a small number of, of slices. Uh, if you have, this is completely random, but more than, 12, more than 10 will probably be too much. And uh, also, this is very important, the values have to differ. If you have similar values, then as in this example, you won't see the differences. You won't be able to spot them. Uh, then, yes, uh, and these two, there is no research, there is no nothing, it's just uh, something that uh, seems to be correct, seems to work, which is uh, sort the slices by value, putting the biggest one at the beginning and then uh, as they decrease on clockwise, for instance, or, on, or reverse. And <clears throat> this is useful because even uh, if you have two values that are different, having them ordered will make sense to the reader as like, uh, yes, uh, in reading order, okay? And the other one is start at 12 o'clock. So the, you have a reference point to compare your angles. So yeah. For instance, this one starts as 12, has few categories. They are quite different, but do you see the problem here? In 3D. In 3D. Yes, and what does 3D do here? Usually the top bottom uh, slice is, uh, seems to be the biggest. Exactly. And which one is the bottom slice here? Apple. Apple. Yeah, what a coincidence, huh? So yeah, even good designers uh, fall on these mistakes. Yes, uh, the other thing is there is always a story. So when you choose your chart and, uh, and, and make plots, you are uh, sending a message. So this one is similar to the one I showed you before. It's the evolution of uh, unemployment in Spain from February to August magically with no points in the middle and yeah you have no y-axis here neither so it appears that uh, yeah it's decreased like a lot but if you see the official one from the i think that one is from the the government uh in general in <coughs> showing the complete y-axis uh you see that the trend is down but uh not as exaggerated as this This is another example of uh, telling a story. This is a chart of gun deaths in Florida. And it has a highlight, a, a mark on 2005 with, when um, uh, a law was uh, approved called the Stand Your Ground, which allowed people to buy guns easier in Florida. And yeah, the problem here is it is inverted, and this is a problem because uh, exactly correct. So uh, I don't think this is innocent because this was released by a lobby, a gun lobby. So what a coincidence again. Uh, but um, this this is called going against the conventions. Yes. So if you go against conventions, the convention says that in in um, in, in uh, line charts or area charts like this one. Uh, you go from zero at the bottom to whatever value at the top. So if you invert it, you are creating um, uh, the, the, this effect of uh, people thinking that when this was enacted, the, the, um, the debts uh, raised, uh, sorry, decreased. So this would be, yes, only by inverting it, you see that the story is completely different. And this is what it should be. This uh, chart was copied, uh, was from another one, which is actually well done. And does this thing in a good way. This is called Irax Bloody Toll. Uh, it was made by Reuters, I think, I don't remember now. And it's a very nice, um, well-designed uh, chart of the casualties in the Iraq war. And this one has the inverted um, axis, zero is here, and the maximum value of uh, deaths is over there. But it works because it uh, 
uh, one, it is a metaphor, of course, a visual metaphor of uh, blood dripping, and also has a lot of granularity. So uh, you, you, you can see as, as there are many lines, <coughs> the, um, and also a lot of white space, the, um, the feeling is that uh, you have more of something in here and not here. Mm -hmm. More reddish words, not more reddish words. Correct. Correct, correct. So, yeah. So it's not a hard rule, but uh, you can invert the axis and, and have nice results. But usually you won't. So if you're going to go against conventions, uh, well, be careful with that. And yeah, to finish, uh, I'm going to... This is a, a, a guide that I use to, to make our projects. Yes, uh, this is like what I consider a safe place to start. These are three questions that uh, uh, help me uh, define what kind of plot or visualization I, want, I, I should make. Um, who is the audience? How will it be used? And what is the goal? This is borrowed from a nice book called uh, Visual Strategies by Frankel and De Pace, which is in the bi bibliography at the end of the presentation, and I recommend. It's a be before-after comparison of uh, visualizations made by the researchers, and the visualizations kind of fixed by these two researchers uh, after uh, well, some redesign to meet these three um, requirements, knowing who the audience is, who, are, who is going to read your, your charts, how will it be used and for what? So I'm going to give you an example. Oh, sorry. Uh, knowing this is important because who is the audience gives you a hint on what level of complexity you, you can achieve. Uh, if your audience are your peers, then you can assume that they know more about what you're talking about or what your data is about. And you can uh, be more technical or go deeper in, in on it. Um, <clears throat> if your audience is, um, I don't know, uh, if you're going to publish it in a newspaper or it's for general public or to show it to your family, then you should be uh, less technical. Yes? Um, yes, how will be it, will it be used is uh, on what support? Is it going for, um, for a research paper, for an article, for a conference, for a poster? Is the, the, where is it going to be displayed? And uh, what is the goal is uh, what, um, what, what, what do you want your audience to make with it? So this is one example. This is the before image. It is a um, um, surface render of a protein complex bound to DNA. Um, so you have subunits in, in red, orange, yellow, and the, the DNA is the, the blue chain over here. I don't know if you can see it. And uh, yes, the renderings are based on data from uh, X-ray diffraction or cryo-M. And this was intended for uh, scientists, experts in bi biology, so peers, uh, their peers. Uh, an expert audience, so it's safe to use field conventions. You can use this type of representation because they are used to see that and to interpret that, yes? Um, also, you can uh, put uh, add technical details if needed. But it will be used on a journal cover. So it is an image more like, uh, let's say, decorative. It is still data visualization, but it doesn't need to be as uh, deep in information because it's going to be for the cover of a journal, not to explain uh, a part of text or, 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 or an article. So uh, ideally, it won't, it, it won't need to have uh, legends, for instance, or, or heavy annotations, because, because it would conflict with the title of the journal and with the text that they put on top of it. 
and the goal is to depict the complex structure and its function in the cell, meaning it's uh, the, the, the context. So the challenge here uh, was to provide context without distracting from the details of the structure. And this is what they did, was showing more of the DNA to show the context of the, of the molecule. Where is it? <coughs> and also use multiple render types to better see the structure. So one moment. So they used these isosurfaces here. And for the complex of interest, they also uh, used the isosurfaces like um, with transparency. But inside, they placed the ribbons representation. So uh, it is also a field convention, and it makes it easier to, to see the, 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 the structure yes, of, the, of the complex. So uh, using that kind of representation has two uses here. One is to differentiate the two things, what is more important and what is uh, context, and also uh, use uh, something that gives you more insight on the data. This kind of representation, the, the helixes, uh, give more information than, than the isosurfaces in this case. Um, yes, also they use uh, color and contrast to, if you see this part of the image is burnt. So for contrast, your eye will go there directly. So you will focus on that part, which is the important one, rather than the rest of the image, which is just for context. So these are the design decisions compo uh, regarding composition and color. Choosing the best plot is not really graphic design. It has more to do with this uh, relying on the uh, um, <coughs> the standards in the in the field. Okay, and this is an example of a movie that uh, we make uh, asking these questions. Yes, so uh, this is what you're going to see is a visualization of uh, the human respiratory system, a short inhalation, it's called a sniff, and uh, they simulated the particles going in the nose through the, down the, um, the throat um, to study the deposition of particles in different parts of the respiratory system uh, that can be used to make better inhalers and things like that, so, and design uh, better drugs. So we did the visualization, but we made two different movies with the same visualizations. One was for a film festival, which is a dissemination, complete dissemination for general public. And the other one was uh, the supercomputing um, conference, which is very, very technical. Breathe. How do we smell? So from now on, the visualizations are exactly the same. So what we did was only change the, the beginning of the movies. So one had more annotations. I don't know if I can... Nah. I can pass it. But if you see here, we have uh, the daughter of my son, which we filmed her uh, smelling the flower. To, <clears throat> to introduce the subject in a different way. While here we have more heavy annotations, yes, of the type of uh, simulation mesh they used, the number of elements and things like that. We have this matrix thing here, which is nothing, but it's just decoration to, to give uh, the context for this dissemination movie. But what is data visualization is essentially the same in both cases. Because this kind of data is, uh, uh, Agradecida, so it's uh, it looks good and is informative at the same time to the level that uh, it can be showed and interpreted by both experts and general audiences. So yes, there is uh, 
there, are, there are more things about this. So this uh, one hour chat was more about uh, trying to raise interest in visualizations on you rather than um, being somewhat uh, giving you um, tools to make your own visualization. So th this wasn't about le teaching you to make visualizations rather than being inspiring or something like that. So you go and look for more information. Uh, because these premises, these things that I talked to you about are the basics, the, the basic things that I still use in my work to do things like this and this. So this is uh, the software that we generally use or you can use for visualization, data analysis, and here you will have your own uh, of the type of research that you do. Data visualizations, you have BMD, which is uh, of life sciences, Paraview for engineering and physics, R, MATLAB, D3, data wrapper, and there are many, many more. Every day, uh, data visualization is like a hot topic now. So there are uh, a lot of uh, online tools to make simple graphs over there. So just look for them if you want. And uh, for design, if you really want to uh, work on the design of visualizations, I strongly recommend you to get uh, Illustrator or the Adobe Suite. It costs a bit of money, but uh, it uh, allows you to a uh, level of manipulation that you cannot achieve with other things, except with uh, three, uh, free software like uh, Inkscape and GIMP but I don't like them because I learned to use Photoshop and now I'm, I just use that. And you also have 3D software, Maya, which is the one I use, and Blender, which is what uh, Paul uses, 3ds Max and others. But uh, yeah, tools are tools. The important thing is knowing what to do with them. And a final piece of advice, it's one of my favorite actors, Michael McCain, uh, John McCain said, uh, if you see something that you like, someone doing someone, something that you like, steal it because they probably did too. So uh, meaning that uh, uh, you can read books, you can uh, visit websites and things like that to learn more about visualization, but a, a great way of inspiration and, and a great way of learning how to do this particular thing is uh, seeing the work of others either good work or bad work. Uh, they are both very informative. So check, uh, one advice is to check visualizations and try to apply what you like in them in your own uh, work. And this is some readings, good books, websites, and a few articles on visualization. These are experimental research on how we perceive and how we can better design uh, visualizations. Uh, I marked in red visual strategies, which is the one that, we, uh, that I showed you the before after example. This one is very easy to read and very good introduction to, to data and information visualization. And here you have tons of visualizations of all kinds to get you inspired. And that's it. That's all I got. Thank you.